mixture of presentations, concerts, and so on. And today is, um, during the daytime, we have the Benjamin workshop, which is sort of a build your own custom uh, analog synth workshop. So there were 15 people busy here. And uh, they all went home with their uh, handmade synth. Just something sounding right like now. Um, and uh, some of them stayed out, and they're going to sort of do a little performance. Um, Santa Barbara, California, and uh, he's going to talk about bioinformatics, uh, general techniques, and how to um, sense our body signals. Um, he's representing a company called Biocontrol. And uh, after that, we'll have the Benjamin workshop uh, perform with uh, Joker, who is one of the teachers. We'll have a break, and then. Uh, we'll have Jan Pitzler talk about his iPhone app, Bliss. Um, and then uh, Jeff Snyder from New York talking about his Mantic controller, that is also sort of a really cool custom uh, controller that he sells. And then at the end, we'll have Jan come back again and do a piece that he made for this Mantic controller. I'm going to pass it on to Alan. Well, good evening. My name is Alan Macy from Santa Barbara. I've lived there for a long time, since 1980. And my first time at Stein was about three years ago. And uh, so second time now, and even though everybody remembers their first time, my uh, second time has been similarly delightful so far. So just very appreciative to be here and um, to um, talk about this particular subject matter, bioinformatics. And this is, um, this is about... Uh, the application of knowledge um, uh, or the derivation of knowledge um, related to the computer analysis of biological data. And the purpose of, I mean, this is a big field, bioinformatics is a large field, but the purpose of, um, of what I wanted to talk about today was for the enhancing, you know, potentially enhancing our composition and performance abilities um, using this um, subject matter, bioinformatics. So potential of this is, uh, the potential of bioinformatics is related to like human physiology and recording data from people, is that uh, you can, we can aim for a, a improved computer user interface. There's this um, possibility of emotional dimension and motivational state feedback. And the third opportunity here is to extend the cross-cultural communication reach of our work that we do. So speaking on behalf of the design process now, or composition process related to, to music. So when it comes to bioinformatics, the perceived composition, like whatever it is we're listening to, it's stimulus. And it doesn't matter what we listen to and how we listen to it. The way that we respond physiologically, it's it's all stimulus to our bodies. And so sometimes there's a profound stimulus, sometimes there's a very minor one, but it always results in stimulus. And the thing is, is that when it comes to people, stimulus always causes physiological responses. So some kind of change in our body state, like maybe our heartbeat's a little faster, maybe a little slower. Uh, perhaps we take deeper breaths. Um, maybe our face twitches a little bit. And it's... Um, it's also extremely clear that physiological responses are linked to this concept of motivational state and also to this idea of emotional dimension. So here's a simple example just to demo what I'm talking about. And I'm <clears throat> going to be talking, I mean, here just consider just some simple facial muscles. So there's like 17 muscles in the face and two in particular we use a lot. And um, one is the zygomaticus. So when you smile, like that. Okay, so this is muscle right here, zygomaticus. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's sensitive to pleasurable uh, phenomena. So it's sensitive. And then um, the other one that we use a lot is the corrugator. This one up here, and so we frown. We're like unhappy or displeased. We, 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 uh, we pull our brows together like this. And so here's a little simple example. And so it might need some sound here. Let's see. So, 
That's it. Sometimes increased um, zygomaticus activity for people. Now, not always and not for everybody, but for many people, this is what will happen. And then... Um, the um, yeah. the awards are for the children uh, who came first in the relay race. Uh, that was uh, Jessica, Bridget... Not altogether pleasant, that experience. So... Um, just to kind of demo that we do, um, you know, behave pretty differently. Our bodies do respond pretty differently to the kinds of things that we see and we hear. And um, so uh, move, moving along, when it comes to human physiological data, there's many different types. There's data, you know, from our, uh, our movement of our eyes and from the uh, all, all across our, the surface of our brains and from the activity of our heart beating called the electrocardiogram, um, signals associated with our metabolic function, like how much oxygen we consume and how much carbon dioxide we produce, and skeletal muscle signals uh, called the electromyogram, and they occur all over the body, and even signals from the peristaltic contraction of your intestines, and um, so lots of, hundreds of different kinds of signals from the body, and much of this data, um, not all of it, but much of it points to this concept of, or this idea of emotional dimension. I'm not talking about emotions per se, like sadness or happiness or any of those things, but but more about like sort of like what sort of general emotional dimension you are. And I'll talk a little a little bit more about what I mean by that. And then um, and then there's also data, very actually it turns out very specific data from the human body that relates to this idea of motivational state and. It's something a little bit different than emotions, but uh, important nonetheless. So here's a, here's a model. Uh, it's called the circumflex model, and it's a, this idea of emotional dimension. There's two axes to the circumflex model. There's, uh, you have this, this, along the vertical axis is this arousal. Um, it means that you're not aroused. It means you are aroused. And then on the horizontal axis... Uh, you don't like something, you're displeased with it, and alternatively, you're quite pleased. And so being um, content or happy means that often you have increased zygomaticus, this smiling, and then um, you also have in, uh, enhanced respiratory depth often. So like when you're just breathing, um, the, the, the thoracic, the expansion and contraction of your thoracic cavity is expanded in, in, in that situation very often. And then conversely, uh, if you're distressed, often you have an increased, increased corrugator. If you're, sometimes these things point pretty specifically to certain areas. The pulse plethysmogram, which is this um, reading that looks at blood volume density in the fingertip, this will increase in this condition uh, generally. And You'll get decreased heart rate and decreased um, skin sweating down here if you're bored or idle versus when you're um, activated or afraid or excited. You have increased heart rate or increased skin sweating. And um, so, but these variables, these physiological variables, they don't they don't point super well to like specific states, but they point much better to kind of quadrants of um, of being. The motivational state's a little bit different. This, this has to do um, with work. Uh, it's very contemporary work, and it's happening in many labs over the, in this, specifically in this area of psych, called psychophysiology. And it's, it's related to this idea, like, how do we approach, like, our lives in general as we move through our day or our week? And what happens is, is that we, we encounter things, you know, in the course of our day, and um, for things that um, you know in, that we encounter, or situations that we encounter, we typically respond to them as either a challenge or a threat. Now, um, I know that those are dramatic sounding words, and, but this is not dramatic really. I mean, it doesn't have to be like a dramatic response. I mean, it could be like a little bit of a challenge or a little bit of a threat or a big challenge or a big threat. But the situation is um, is very clear physiologically what happens and in a challenge response, and a challenge response also means that the thing that we encounter, the situation that we encounter, means that we feel on some level we have enough resources to be able to approach and handle the situation, to um, 
face it. And when you're um, when you when you're threatened by something, it means that on some level you feel you don't have the resources to handle it. And resources can be all kinds of things. It can be kind of like knowledge. It can be family connections. It can be some kind of like sort of hidden information that you have about something. But a very broad term, what resources mean. But just fundamentally, it's like as you go through your day, you're either kind of challenged or threatened. So um, is believed by many psychophysiologists. And so. In a challenge response, you have a drop in blood pressure, you have an increase in stroke volume, which means that each time your heart pumps, um, a stro uh, with each beat of your heart, you pump a little bit more blood, that's stroke volume. And then vascular resistance is a sort of like, um, you know, your, your, all your, uh, your veins and your arteries in your body, they kind of open up a little bit more. And so it means that the overall resistance drops, and so you consequently, that's associated with this drop in blood pressure, despite the increase in stroke volume. This is the same kind of response that you would get if you stick your hand in like nice warm water. It's the same exact physiological response. And so in a threat response, what happens is, is that your blood pressure increases a little bit, your stroke volume increases a little bit, and your vascular resistance increases a little bit in a, stress, in a threat response. And so anyway, they're very uh, easy to, to identify physiologically, the, these states. And the end result of all this is that we're more inclined to relate to, to participate in, and to engage a situation if we're challenged rather than threatened. And talk a little bit about how that relates to design. So specifically, there's this idea of like this emote, like <clears throat> This, this sort of interface, like, you know, as you're composing or designing, you know, something, you know, some kind of musical sequence, some kind of composition. And so the way that this might happen, I imagine, is that you present audio to the designer. And then the, then the computer, I mean, I, I guess what we're talking about is sort of like this, this, the possibility of sort of like an enhanced user interface between computer and designer in this course, of, in the course of um, of, uh, of composing music, so the computer could present the audio to the designer. The the composer could the computer could sense the physiological changes occurring within the composer's body. The computer could make some estimation, some kind of like determination about the composer's emotional dimension or motivational state, and then perhaps there's some kind of decision: Am I going to take action? Is the computer going to take action? And no, maybe do nothing, or yes, maybe will take action, and then that might result in some sort of stimulus to the designer, right? And it, we can talk about like what that might be later, but this is sort of like a, an empathic loop that could be created between the composer and the computer during the course of design. So here, here's an, uh, just a simple example of, um, of a human-computer link. And it's not really related to specifically the issue of design, but it, 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 it uh, is, a, is an interesting example because it deals with a lot of the fundamentals I'm talking about, which is this kind of idea of, of the computer is aware of like what is going on physiologically with the person and is presenting new data to the person as a consequence of what it's receiving. And so this, is, uh, this interface here is actually specifically about trying to extract what this person is thinking in terms of the letter that they're seeing. So here's a... Okay, so what's happening here is that... Uh, see that uh, line of uh, that's been illuminated here? Well, you can't see it at all, but this is a, it's a matrix of letters, and so it's simply illuminating that line, and when the person thinks that they see the letter in that column, then the computer can sense the fact that they've seen that, and then they can identify the um, this sort of vertical dimension, and then the computer does the same thing horizontally, and then when they get an XY match, it says, aha, this is what you're thinking, therefore um, it can put up that letter. So just, it just this is, I'm presenting this really just to show that this possibility of creating a link is, um, you know, it's actually quite viable. And m maybe it doesn't look anything like this in terms of, you know, the ECG cap or whatever, but um, the idea there. So here's the... A positive, here's the kind of concept of a designer loop. So you have the computer that the designer is working with. It's some, you know, it stores data and it has a monitor and, and uh, uh, speakers and 
And then there's a mouse and a, a keyboard. This is, we typically use pointing interfaces to control our computers. And, and then, um, so the, the, the designer has some, they sense, right? They, they hear the audio, they see the, the video, and they have some motivational, emotional cognitive response to what it is they've just perceived, right? And, and then there's some rational guidance. Um, and the designer forms an idea, and then they either think that maybe something should be changed or not. And so there's some physiological control where you apply data through the keyboard or the mouse, and you modify the data result here, right? And then you, you proceed in this sort of like, uh, in this case here, what I've got shown is a counterclockwise fashion. So when you, um, when you talk about this possibility of like direct emotional interfacing, you know, in, in terms of like with this, um, with this computer, then uh, in the process of design, what happens is, is that instead of just the people um, physiologically uh, sensing, right, what the computer is presenting, right, I just, I'm the designer and I'm seeing, okay, the computer is presenting me with this video or it's presenting me with this audio, right. Um, the computer now is also sensing me, right? So it's sensing my emotional state. It's my emotional dimension. It's sensing my motivational state. And so in the, may, perhaps maybe what would happen is, is that there might be some sort of different, uh, you know, kind of like um, phenomena that occurs during this time. And um, this, this kind of like, uh, this like sort of a looping process that occurs here. So I know this is getting a little complicated, um, but, uh, when you put the, um, de there, there's two aspects, right, to this, this process, right? There's the designing process where the designer goes through and goes through this, um, this looping process in, in terms of creating whatever it is they're creating. And then there's also like, well, who is it for, right? So it's not just for me, right? It's for some audience. So it's for a recipient somewhere. And, and so you have the same kind of like, uh, like process here for a recipient where they sense what ha what's happening. They have some motivational, emotional, cognitive response. They have some guidance, that rational guidance, and then they form an idea about what it is they've just heard. And normally, when you're composing or designing, what happens is, is that the only way you can get feedback here from what the recipient thinks to what the designer is doing is through this communication medium, which is like, um, like an email or a smile on the face or... Um, or uh, maybe a public opinion survey, or and it's quite variable, and um, uh, um, and but it's what we have now, and it it's um, completely serviceable, and it's would be very different than this kind of feedback, which is sort of direct motivational, emotional, cognitive response data, right, from the recipient coming back to the user interface, and then the designer becomes a little bit more aware of precisely what it is the, uh, the, um, the recipient is, is um, experiencing. So what's possible now? Um, this is a little, a little more practical. Uh, so what we can do now is we can establish information about someone's emotional dimension. We can determine motivational state. And we can introduce real-time stimulus into the composition process or performance. And so what the kind of data that would be required here would be like electrocardiographic data, electrodermal activity data, electromyographic data, skeletal muscle, the pulse pathogram, respiration, skin temperature. For motivational state, we can acquire data, blood pressure, ECG, or stroke volume. And let's say as a designer, okay, well, what might the computer want to do? So perhaps the computer might... Uh, might, you're sitting there in front of the computer and the computer senses that you're something, and it senses something. And so maybe it, it, it changes the smell in the room just ever so slightly. Like maybe it makes it smell, I don't know, differently. Or perhaps it throws up a coffee icon on the screen or changes ambient music in the room or maybe your chair's a little cold. And um, if you're struggling, maybe it even introduces relevant, a relevant hyperlink related to what it is you're, you're working on. Now, there's this other aspect of, like, this would be sort of, like, design-related. And I don't really know all the things that it could do. I, I mean, I have no idea, really. Of, but they're just kind of um, simple things. And uh, 
On the performance side, what could happen here is that you could modify audio in real time as a function of performer or recipient emotional dimension or motivational state. So you can actually modify, you know, kind of tweak the, uh, the audio in real time depending on kind of what the performer is, you know, really like emotionally dimensionally at or motivationally at or what the recipients are, are at. And um, so... A specific, like to get a little bit more specific here, um, like also during this, uh, um, like let's say during this composition process, you can do this thing called post-processing emotional analysis, which is where you play the audio, right? And uh, then you can, you can evaluate the listener's um, physiological record during the audio performance, during the music, and then you can, you can match the listener's emotional dimension and her motivational state with the elements of the composition. So... You could do something like this. Like, let's say uh, you're monitoring motivational state. So challenge is up. Threat is down. Uh, this is valence. So this would be like pleasurable, displeasurable. And this is aroused, not aroused. And so then you can say, oh, gee, during audio segment, whatever, this happened. And maybe that's like a really good thing. And maybe that would want to be balanced with something else coming later. And maybe what happened, it's just kind of like, it's information, right? It's like information that's sort of interesting. And I'm not quite sure, you know, I personally don't know quite all of what it means. It's just that it's kind of like these days, relatively easy to get. And it's not information we're normally accustomed to seeing. And so um, how, we, how do we get this data? You can use probes inside the body, which we're not going to talk about at all. We can use non-invasive probes, which attach to the outside of the body, or you can use non-contact probes. And so non-invasive signals would be things like the electrocardiogram and the brain waves and the, contra the contractual activity of your stomach or non-invasive cardiac output or goniometry or tremor, or respiration, airflow. I mean, the whole slew of biochemical data you can acquire, uh, blood oxygen and pH and functional near-infrared imaging and all that stuff. Um, and they're attached kind of like this, this way, in all these various ways. And, um, but it's, they're getting very sophisticated. Like this is a, this is a wireless um, multi-channel physiological recorder. It's, it records 18 channels of data. It's complete, very unobtrusive. It goes, um, uh, it's uh, just like a strap that goes around the torso and it acquires like electrocardiogram and respiration and body position and all kinds of information. And um, this is, this is kind of interesting. This is, uh, this is emerging technology. And uh, this, is, this is called functional near-infrared near imaging. And this, this technique allows you to kind of like look like right into the brain, the top half inch of the cerebral cortex. And um, this is like the, the source of executive function in the brain. And um, it shines through, through wavelengths of light through the skull, and then they were, the data is reflected, and then you can determine what you would determine in like a functional magnetic resonance imaging chamber. Like normally, instead of lying down with like the big thing on your head, this is like a portable version of that. And these would be typical non-contact signals, sound and image and motion and temperature and CO2. And microwave Doppler radar is an especially interesting technology. This is sort of like the Star Trek tricorder. You can point this at someone three meters away and you can extract information about their respiratory rate or how fast their heart's beating. Um, their scent, heel, toe strike, gait, weight, biochemical analysis, and some stimulus response options. This is, uh, I thought was pretty interesting. This is Philips Corporation and they're working on um, uh, emotional sensing, uh, like jewelry, basically. And it's a uh, it, it combines, um, you know, it uses conductive, con conductive ink and, and certain kinds of textile sensors, and it, it can read um, uh, multiple signals and then transmit them to computers or other people. And so we talked, uh, what I talked about today was uh, this kind of idea of, like, the relevance of this. It's this kind of a potential of 
ability to modify composition and real-term performance by establishing this kind of emotional rapport between people and potentially computers and recipients, kind of just mix them all up. And then um, the kind of available tools and methods, and so non-invasive, non-contact tools to determine these things, the emotional dimension of motivational state. And then there's a lot of work really here, though, that, that, about how to connect these things together, in, um, you know, even assuming we want to. Okay. So um, uh, these determinations to specific stimuli to like aid the design process or aid the performance process or, or whatever. Now, that's it. And, but I did have one thing, which was a, a demo, and it's specifically on this issue of like, uh, like physiological measurement. And this, this is kind of, um, you know, I know it's time that there's a lot of sophistication in this area. And I'm just dabbling in it a little bit. But um, it's this idea of like taking, you know, signals um, from the human body and then, and then sonifying them. And so I just thought it would be kind of interesting to sort of see... Um, if uh, we were so, could maybe coax a volunteer to have this experience. Yeah. Superb. Okay. <laughs> any questions about any of this? As we're, okay. we're going to be applying these electrodes. They're, these are essentially just like attachment points to the skin. And all we're going to be doing, excuse me, what's your name? Boris? Yeah. Boris, excellent. I'm Alan. Perfect. Okay. So um, have a seat, Boris. Stop okay. smiling. Okay. So um, the, the, Bo Boris's body is, 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 is um, filled with electricity, and all we're going to do is we're just going to measure a little bit of this electricity. So it's, it's just a signal that Boris manifests all the time. It just normally we can't experience it or it can't um, perceive it really in any way. And so it just happens to be about, the signal we're going to look at is about a thousandth of a volt. And um, uh, what we're going to do is look at several things. We're going to look at this kind of like um, Boris's physiological structure going from this arm to this arm. And so that consists of skeletal muscle, heartbeat, I'm sorry, the electrocardiogram or the heart, the cardiac muscle contracting, and then down this side too. And so you're going to, we're going to look at this like loop, right? So... What will happen is that when we sonify this, we're going to hear sort of like this like sound from the muscles, and we're also going to hear this sort of sound from the heart. And then you'll be able to kind of like sort of mediate between the two, depending on what it is you're going to do. So that's it. So um, so these are just like, this is like salt water, really. It's all it is. And so it just permeates the skin ever so slightly. It's like... Um, you were special. Uh, no, these are just like you... They, these are just found in any hospital. You perform the electrocardiogram. Are there specific points? Well, we're just going to look at this whole, I mean, we could put these anywhere. No matter where we put these on, on uh, Boris, we would pick up something. But um, we're, uh, we're just going to look at this sort of one, uh, one chain here. So the, all, all I'm doing, this is a differential amplifier. And so all I'm doing is a measuring, it's like putting a voltmeter, right, on Boris from this point to this point. That's all we're doing. And so it's just all we're doing is measuring what's there. So this is a positive input here. This is a negative input. And this is just a reference or a gram. This does nothing other than just tell the machine that Boris is there. OK, so just relax. Okay. <laughs> all right. So OK, I'm going to unplug this. OK, right here. OK. Okay, let's see if I can uh, figure out what I'm doing now. Um, okay, that's that's Boris's uh, electro. That's Boris's heartbeat <laughs> that we're hearing here. It's kind of sonified a little bit. Hey, all right. Okay. So what we're going to do now is um, think about this here. Okay. I'm going to pitch it up. Yeah. 
Delicious. again okay so that's kind of more than more of the real sound but harmonized a little bit but. okay let me try um, maybe try standing and holding your hands Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, any questions about anything you've heard today? Let's start setting up the next. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, heard, we started hearing all sorts of transients when he was, uh, for instance, attacking his muscle. What was that? Well, um, the EMG is pretty complicated signal, and so it might have been a, kind of an onset, EMG onset signal. Could be. So it was just something on top of his muscle. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, kind of like part of this uh, chain, right, that we were looking at. And so some aspect of, uh, of muscle physiology. So what kind of fluctuation voltage are you looking at? Um, the voltage that we're looking at is, is, is about a millivolt at the most, and it's typically about 500 millionths of a volt. And that would be the range that we'd be looking at if I were, say, cross-correlating a number of, a number of responses. I'd be looking in that same range. Generally. Yeah, as much, maybe uh, like nominally about so say his size, Yeah, everybody's different. There's about a factor of 10 difference in the human population okay. on these signals. About. Excuse me? Compositionally speaking, you're, you're following my, my heart rate and, and the, the voltage that my body is producing. How much of that is filtered through devices that can give you more practical results and more random? Um, well, uh, this is, I'm, you're, I, I'm a huge neophyte in this area, so uh, I know very little about musical pro uh, processing, data processing. Uh, um, all I can say is, is that for the, are you talking about specifically about the demo today, or are you talking about like in general? I, I think more of a general usage to get, you know, some, some more of an experimental result versus more of a compatible tool that you can get really, um, I guess there would be some kind of mapping, right? You, you have this physiological data, and you, you're going to make some assumptions about how you want it to, to map to where you want to go. So you know, you're maybe looking at heart rate, and you're saying, okay, maybe this will somehow relate, just for uh, our news discussion, maybe it's going to some, some, somehow relate to rhythm and whatever it is you're doing. But you can have a very specific relationship between the rhythm of the heart and rhythm of the penis. And that can just be mathematically determined. Is there a lot of hysteresis in that signal that you're filtering out before your sound coming? 
No. No. Because of him or because the signal itself? No, the signal itself is just analog data. So it's very rich. It's rich, complex analog data. It just happens to be mostly low frequency, though. So almost all the signals you get, you know, except for the skeletal muscle, are below human hearing. And so in order to hear it, I need to harmonize it to hear it. But you're hearing harmonics that are related to the fundamental. What was that that you were running the signal through before the two pedals? The first pedal was just a pitch shifter. And then the second pedal was a digital delay. But after that? That's it. Just those two, a pitch shifter and a digital delay. Yeah. Uh-huh, yes. Do you consider yourself more of a musician or a researcher? I'm not a musician. Yeah, I'm more of a researcher. Okay. Just curious. So we'll move on to... Yes. Thank you. Throughout the afternoon, from 12 to 6, basically we will... Everybody has built an instrument. And so let's see what we got here. We'll get some humming.
was the world of blips and blobs mm. and strange filter movements and very interesting modulations. And what we did today, we built this little circuit board powered by two batteries with one output, but a lot of more outputs and inputs to actually interface it with other uh, analog gear. 
And maybe Rob want to say a couple of words about the workshop today? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, Come up front. <laughs> the, idea, hello, I'm Rob. the idea of this workshop is uh, for people to actually sort of uh, uh, build something yourself. And then we try to make sure that at the end of the workshop all the things that people have built actually work. So you go home with a, a piece of electronics that is purely analog and, uh, and is something that you've built yourself, which is uh, uh, getting a real rare experience these days because everybody is so used to software. And uh, one of the ideas about this, this, this actual analog thing was that uh, the thing with software is that software is never finished. You think it's finished, and then next month there will be the new release with all the new functions, etc., etc. And you have to learn things, and that way it constantly evolves. And I've been working with computers for some 30 years, so I know it's always been like that, and I think it will always be like that. But the beauty of a physical analog thing is that once it's ready, it's ready. That's it. And then live with it or not. <laughs> and that's uh, and I thought that sort of experience also needs to be there for people that like that. So yeah, that's and well we still left something open because this is the circuit board and there are some pins that are not connected to anything yet, but you might end up with a box like this because this is my version of uh, the Benjolin. And I think everybody uh, who particip participated in this workshop will build his own very individual instrument out of this basic instrument that we provided. It's of course true that it's still a, a, a finite instrument with uh, still a lot of possibilities to interface with other things. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of open, but it's a uh, it's a fixed and uh, a fixed design that will never change to a stopwatch or anything like that. And there is a certain educational part in this that it's like uh, it's like you're you're help halfway with a design that's already fully built, but then you go home and then you have to put it in a box, and then it's up to your own total creativity. And we have a little forum on the internet where people have been to these workshops are posting the pictures of what they did afterwards with that, and it's amazing to see. I'm completely different sort of things uh, that, uh, that that produces. So I really would like to uh, invite uh, my real good friend Joker, who uh, is a fantastic player of all these uh, instruments. And, uh, and like he said, uh, we're uh, partners in electronic and sonic crime. And, uh, to, and I would like to invite all the people that uh, would like to participate okay. uh, in, the, in the session. Omnico uh, Benjamin Orchestra on your places. There's one somebody who was not connected
Yeah, I was into the left. The very fact that here is these people have their instruments for like maybe two hours. They were able to rehearse maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> so there's a lot to explore still and put bigger knobs on them. So I had it easy. I, I could see what I'm doing. So yeah. very great playing. Thank you very much. For like 15 minutes rehearsal, it was great. Yeah. I liked it.